Doesn't that sound good to our ears and hearts? Doesn't it? Doesn't that sound like good news? We come into this world in the dark. We have a dark problem, a sin problem, but God has provided a remedy whereby we might see the light and be aware of Him and be in relationship with Him. I'm Terry Knight, the pastor here at New Life Community Church, and I thank you so much for turning us on, tuning us in. I really do appreciate you being a part of this fellowship for the next 28 and a half minutes or so. My prayer is that the Word of God would speak to your heart. I have very little to say, folks, that's going to change your life, but the Word of God can make an eternal impact on your life, and I trust you'll receive it tonight, not just with your physical ears, but with your spiritual ears, your heart. We're going into a, a brand new teaching tonight. It's found in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, although I'm going to read another verse in your hearing, but it deals with the subject of light and dark. Light and dark. I don't think I, in fact, I know that I've never lived in a time where light and dark was more distinct we see a lot of darkness in and around the world that we live in. And I'm speaking about spiritual darkness, not physical darkness. Boy, we have plenty of physical light, don't we, for the time being. But the spiritual darkness is just unbelievable. But there's something that can overcome that and something that can overcome that in your life. And that's what we're going to be talking about, the light of the world. Let me jump right on into this. Uh, again, I want to read a marginal passage. It's found in Matthew, and we'll be looking at this very shortly into the message. Matthew chapter 4, and I've landed around verse 16, and the record puts it this way. The people, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. He continues in verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. And here's what he preached. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Father God, I thank you for each one that's turned on this telecast. And I pray in Jesus' name, by the power of the Spirit, that you would speak through your word to each heart. Help us to know and understand the light. And how that by being in the light, we can be overcomers of this present darkness. We pray, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, you hang on. I'm going to be back here in just a little while. Keep your Bibles handy. Keep your pen and paper handy. And uh, kind of follow along with us and uh, copy down those study notes. I'll be back here directly. God bless. Sharing with you a message is tied very simple. Light and dark. Light and dark. That's been echoing in my spirit for days now. So I went to the Word of God and I said, Okay, Lord, what would you have me tell these folks on Sunday morning? To begin with, there's a simple five-letter word that's presented to us over and over and over again in the Word of God, and it is L-I-G-H-T. Said out loud with me again, light. Again, light. Going back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, that's almost right in the very beginning. But in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, we read this, And God said, not Terry, not some denomination, not some church somewhere or another, although we all repeat this, but God said, Let there be light, and there was light. How cool is that? There wasn't any light, and God said light, and there was light. In the Hebrew, that word is or, and it means very simply, light. Some other words help us understand the concept like daylight or sun or sunlight. Now frankly as I pondered this in particular Friday morning, I don't believe it is a necessity to spend much of your time this morning attempting to help you comprehend light because you're all 
all too familiar with it. Can I get an amen right there? Just to show you what I'm talking about right now, would everybody in the sound of my voice just close your eyes? Close your eyes. Now, on the count of three, I want you to open them. Are you ready? A one and a two and a three and open them. Voila, you just illustrated for yourself dark and light. You know all about light. The reference, Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, a writer has said this about that reference, I should say. Light was God's initial instrument for illuminating the dark and formless void. It was the inaugural instance of God shining light in the darkness. Now, as we move on over into the New Testament, we discover the same word, light. Obviously, in the New Testament, it's the Greek and not the Hebrew, the Greek phos. It's put forth by the old tax collector, sometimes called Levi. We know him, you may know him better as Matthew. And as I understand it, by the will of God, Matthew would become an apostle. By supernatural inspiration, Matthew reminds us of an Old Testament prophecy. Now watch this. Matthew is in the New Testament era, the New Covenant era, and he gives us uh, a prophecy from the Old Testament. I always think it's pretty neat when they reach from the New Testament back into the Old or from the, the New Covenant back into the Old. There's a foretelling given in Isaiah chapter 9 pertaining to God's Son, and that's none other than Christ Jesus. Isaiah chapter 9, which was written some 714 years before the coming of the Christ child. But this is about the Christ child. Fill in number one with me on your study notes, if you would, please. Beloved Jesus, make no mistake about it, Jesus the Christ, Meshua, Messiah, Jesus Christ fulfilled this prophecy from Isaiah, and Matthew records it and confirms it. Look with me back in Matthew chapter 4, verse 16. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And then we're told in verse 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach. And here's what he was preaching. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. If you read Mark's account, you'll find out that Mark is fairly conservative with his use of the word light. But Luke, and especially John, as we're about to find out, come forth with some pretty enlightening usages. Are you with me so far? Say amen if you're really here. All righty. That brings us back to a little bit of introduction, brings us right back to our text passage. John chapter 1, verse 4. Look at this. We're told in him was life, and that life was the light of men. If you look at the middle part or middle to the latter part of verse 7, we read, so that through him all men might believe. And then once again, Verse 9, the true light, the true light that gives light to every man. I love that, every man. I don't have to pick and choose because God has said this applies to every man. But that light, that true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Now, I took you back there and I ran back through those real brief light to say this to you. There's a very significant concept that is given to us in these latter two verses of John chapter 1, the latter two that I've just rehearsed before you. Theologians call it very simply the Incarnation. Are you familiar with that? The incarnation. Number two on your study notes. Incarnation is a long, complex sounding term that simply means in the flesh. Incarnation. In the flesh. Now, for you Bible scholars, you will not find that word in Scripture. It is a theological term used to describe an event that is in the Scripture, much like the term rapture. We've taught, taught you about that before. John helps us see that Jesus, the Son of God, 
took on human form, took on human flesh, the incarnation. Now, it may initially strike you as odd, but for us in the modern era, the incarnation is commemorated and celebrated every year. Does anybody have any idea when we celebrate that? Christmas time, what we call Christmas time. The Bible tell, talks about when unto us a child was born. God became flesh and dwelt for a while among us. It's very interesting to me, and I'm not going to belabor this point, but it's very interesting to me in that uh, uh, nativity scene, if you please, there is a, a great light, i.e. a star that led the wise men to the light. Now, I find that interesting. You may want to do a little study on that at some point in time. Now, within the scope of the incarnation, the purpose of God becoming flesh. Now, you may have scratched your head at some point in time and said, what is that all about? Why would God stoop to that level? That's a good question. Within that purpose, or His purpose was, beloved, to come to earth in order to reveal something to us. And in coming to earth, Christ Jesus did reveal something to us. And it is indicated here in the first part of chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 4. I'm going back there once again. I'm repeating myself on purpose. I want you to see this. In Him, Jesus Christ was life. Say that out loud with me. Life. Again, Life. Look at this. And that life, Jesus' life, was the light of all mankind. Why was Jesus sent to the earth? He was sent. Why did Jesus consent and come to the earth? One writer puts it this way. I couldn't say it any better, so I'll quote him. Jesus Christ came to bring the light of God's life into, watch this, a spiritually dark and dying world. How many of you know this is a spiritually dark and dying world? If you did not know that, then you can leave here today saying, well, I learned something. We live in a spiritually dark and dying world. Okay? It's true. Pastor, I didn't come here to be discouraged today. Well, I'm not going to discourage you. I'm going to encourage you, but you're going to have to stick with me. We've got to go through the process, okay? Now, for the next few moments, I'm going to be in a little parentheses. For those of you that are new to new life, I do little parentheses. It will support what I'm talking about, so it would pay you to listen very carefully. Here it is, and I'll try to tell you when we come out of that parentheses. The Apostle John from whence our text passage comes this morning, John perseveres to bring this all together in the third chapter of his writing. Turn over there with me now, if you would, please. If you're in chapter 1, you won't have to turn too far. John chapter 3. Now be reminded, and, and here's a little bracket within my parentheses. If you're new to the Bible, I encourage you to start reading the Bible and read in John. I was able to, to encourage some young men, several young men this week, to begin doing just exactly that. Be reminded that John chapter 3 gives us some fundamental foundations of the gospel. What does that mean? Fundamental foundations. You sure do love to use them big old words. That means this is the basics. You need to know this. John chapter 3 and verse number 7 says this. Jesus is speaking. And when Jesus speaks, it would behoove you to listen. All righty? And it says, You should not be surprised. Who is you? It was Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jewish ruling council. Nicodemus, you should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. Watch this. He wasn't just talking to Nicodemus. He was talking to everybody. Anybody and everybody that's ever come along, you must be born again. I ain't going to be born again. Listen, if you don't, there's some consequences. And we'll talk about that some, some more here in just a few moments. But there's some good news. You don't have to suffer those consequences. Jesus said you must be born again. Why don't we hear that talked about more in our churches and from the mouths of people that claim to know Christ? Jesus said you must be born again. Doesn't that behoove you to say to your friends and neighbors and your family members, Jesus said you must be born again. Have you? How about what? Have you been born again? 
Hey, I'm here to tell you this morning, Pastor Terry has been, May the 8th, 1973. That was a long time ago. Knelt at an old-fashioned altar, they called it. It wasn't all that old. I don't know who fashioned it. Actually, I think my daddy built it. But I knelt right there, and I, I confessed my sins, repented of my sins, asked Jesus Christ to come into my life, and he did. And I tell you, I went down a loser, but I come up a winner. Say amen right there. Uh, something clicked on the inside of me that night. It may not click on you the way it clicked on me, but I'm telling you, born again is Bible language. It's serious language. It's eternal language, and you need to understand it. I'm a little passionate about that. I wish I could cram it down your throat. I wish I could make you be born again. I wish I could make you be a fit candidate for heaven. I do. I would, if I could take a hammer and beat it into you, I'd weld a snot out of you. But I can't. You must be born again. Okay? I am passionate about it, but it's going to be your decision at the end of the day. Have you been born again? Listen to John 3, 16 that follows that. Man, it's cool how all this follows one right after the other. And remember, we're in a little parentheses right here. You know John 3, 16. My latest disciple had to memorize that this week. And it goes something like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, his only begotten son, that... Whosoever believes in him should not perish, should have eternal life. And then I took you there to tell you this, verse 19 of John chapter 3. Look at that, John, 9, uh, John chapter 3, verse 19. The first part of the verse says in the New International Version, this is the verdict. Here it is. Here is the conclusion of the matter. And that's what John is doing here in chapter 3. Here's what he says, the latter part or middle part of verse 19, light has come into the world. Here's the conclusion of the matter. You must be born again. Everybody needs to be born again. Jesus died for everyone. Here is the period on the end of that light has come into the world. Well, hallelujah. Let's quickly go to number three on your study notes. Will you? I want you to understand this. By the way, I'm out of the parentheses. Don't you feel better now? Jesus, the light, not just a light, but the light, was not just given as an illuminating source to help keep us from bumping into things. Are you with me? Rather, God became flesh and came to us for the purpose of bringing forth spiritual light or a spiritual awareness. Not just some physical light or something to illuminate our world so that we can see. But also a spiritual light to help us to be aware or to see things spiritually. Helping those of us who are in spiritual darkness see or realize our spiritual dilemma. And hopefully, having seen or, or realized that spiritual dilemma, we'll purpose to receive His light, which brings to us righteousness. And that, beloved, will deliver us, can deliver us, and is purpose to deliver us from the dark. Wow. Doesn't that sound good to our ears and hearts? Doesn't it? Doesn't that sound like good news? We come into this world in the dark. We have a dark problem, a sin problem, but God has provided a remedy whereby we might see the light and be aware of Him and be in relationship with Him. That sounds good maybe more than you know because you see, apart from Christ, apart from the light, this is important, all persons, are groping about spiritually, not physically, but spiritually, running into walls because of their own darkness, because of their own sins, the darkness and the sins they have engaged. 
And if such ones are not introduced to and choose to, as we alluded to earlier, choose to embrace the light upon their death. And let me just remind you, just real brief like, that if you live long enough, you're going to pass away. Man, live preacher, you want to talk about such stuff? Because I'm in the funeral business, and I've observed a lot of people over the years that act like they're shocked when someone passes away. It is shocking, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I know that all too well. And I've walked with so many of you through that valley of the shadow of death. But it is a reality. And on the other side of that reality is a reality as well. If you live long enough, you'll pass away. And beloved, upon your death, if you have not embraced this light, then you will spend eternity in darkness. Not only groping around in this present existence in darkness, but you'll spend eternity in darkness. What are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about a place that God has warned us about, a place of eternal separation from God, a place that's called hell. Now, I know people don't like for you to talk about hell today, but that's okay. There's a lot of things people don't like today that they need to know, and this certainly is one of them. Matthew chapter 8, if you want to write this down, I'm not sure I included this on your notes. Matthew 8 and 12, 2 Peter chapter 2, various and sundry other passages that mention the darkness, that place of eternal separation, darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know one thing that I know, Brother Patrick, one thing that I know about people, or about what happens when people preach on hell? It makes people nervous. It ought to make you nervous. If I thought I was going to spend eternity separated from God in a dark place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, that would make me nervous. Let me tell you something. I get nervous sitting in the dentist office out in the waiting room and I hear that drill in the other room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's not for eternity. And he has lights in there. And although he works on my teeth, I usually don't gnash them at him. (laughs) That would make me nervous. This really kind of lays the foundation for what I felt impressed to talk to you about this morning. And I'm already at study note number four. At this pace, we'll be out of here by 1.30. Listen, spiritually, before anyone can truly appreciate the light, first they have to recognize their own darkness. Their own darkness. That's why we talk about these things. People need to know this. Beloved, it's tough talking to folks about this as long as one remains in the dark. How many of you know that it is difficult to see in the dark? Let me illustrate. Again, would you, everybody, would you just close your eyes? Close them real good and tight. Say amen when you've got them closed. Now keep them closed. And here's a question for you. Can you see me? You probably already forgot what I look like. In case you did, I'm a good-looking hunk of preacher up in here. That's what I'm talking about. Now you can open your eyes again. Isn't it difficult to see in the dark? Yeah, that's physically. Spiritually, it's difficult as well. Mr. Barnes, in his very fine commentary, says this, Darkness is the emblem, symbol, representation of ignorance, iniquity, which is really personal sin, error, superstition. He adds, whatever is opposite to truth and piety. That is darkness. Again, John talks about this. I'm back in chapter 1, verse number 5. Look at what he says. The light shines in the... Beloved, we're going to attempt to wrap it up right there. And let me just reiterate something to you that we were getting to. And it is this, a great light has come into the world, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus has come. Now, during this particular season of the year, it seems like we, uh, we, the church, talk about that more. Perhaps we should talk about it more than we do. A great light has come. But John tells us that the world loved the darkness more. So here's my question for you as we wrap things up for this particular session. Where are you in that equation? 
The light has come into the world. Are you following the light, chasing after the light, or do you love the darkness, the things of this world, more? We only need to peer into a life for just a moment to figure that out and to listen to the way people talk and to discern how they think and to watch what they do and what they own and where they go in order to figure that out. Are you chasing after the light? I want to be an encouragement to you to be a Jesus chaser. Not only to say, hey, I was baptized a hundred years ago or whatever the case might be, or I signed a paper or somebody told me I was okay, but I want to encourage you to read the Word of God, the Bible for yourself and know and understand what it means in John chapter 3 when Jesus said, you must be born again. When the light said, you must be born again, have you? Have you asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins, to come into your heart, to establish you as a member of the forever family of God? Have you confessed your sins and repented of your sins? If not, I encourage you to right now. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. Folks, it's true. God loves you, and He has a wonderful plan for your life. But you have to personally accept that plan, not reject it, and walk in that plan, not just claim uh, by talk, but you literally walk the walk. And I believe this, when you are born again, something changes on the inside. Second Corinthians tells us all things become new. Something changes, and the want to for the things of this world is changed. It's almost like a switch is flipped. Then we begin that mind-renewing process as we read and study the Word of God and get it into us, understanding how God, the light, wants us to live. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for each one listening in, and I pray specifically for that one that you have led to a point where they know that they're empty and they're in darkness and they need you. They need the light. I pray that right now would be the time when they confess their sins and sinfulness and open up their heart and invite you to come in to forgive them of their sin, to establish them as a member of the forever family of God. And may they not only talk the talk, but learn to walk the walk in the rest of the days of their life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Hey, I am Terry Knight, and the pastor of New Life Community Church, and I would be amiss if I didn't take this opportunity to invite you to come out and be a part of what's taking place here. We do have a regular schedule of activity Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love to have you. We also have midweek activities Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock, something for nearly every member of the family. It's very important for you to connect with the body of Christ. I want to be an encouragement to you to do just exactly that. I am Terry Knight, the pastor of New Life Community Church. I trust you're going to have a great week, what's left of it. And remember, my friends, Jesus is coming back. Is He coming back for you?